My name is Harriet Whitting, and this is a presentation about the International Classification of Functioning and Disability, or the ICF, as a clinical reasoning model. Models are as old as physiotherapy, and one of the first models was Nagy's disablement model, which is basically a linear model from pathology to impairment. And impairments, of course, then cause functional limitations, and the functional limitations cause disability. This is pretty straightforward, and it assumes that pathology is ultimately responsible for people's disability. A very biomedical uh, point of view. The Nagy model was followed by a disablement model by Verbrugge and Jette in 1994, which showed some moderating factors. So we see the same main pathway from pathology to impairment to functional limitations and disability, but now we see modifiable factors such as extra individual factors or external factors, risk factors which are predisposing characteristics and intra-individual factors, as lifestyle activity levels, psychosocial mechanism coping, etc. Oh. This model was then followed by the International Classification of Functioning, Disability and Health, which was adopted in 2001. And this became the international standard to describe and measure health and disability, and also represents a more biopsychosocial model of health. In this picture, you can see that the health condition is thought to influence body functions and structures, as well as activities and participation, and they in their turn are influenced by environmental factors and personal factors. Activities and participation both have two qualifiers, capacity and performance. Capacity means what you can measure in a, in a lab, and performance is what people actually do. Personal factors are as yet undefined, so we can fill them in ourselves and environmental factors are not very well defined either, but I'll give you examples later on. And for instance, for activities, a capacity test would be a 10 minute walk test, which is basically what you perform in the laboratory or your healthcare environment, where performance is what people actually do in their own environment. In evidence-based practice, we are supposed to combine research evidence with patients' preferences and actions and the patient's clinical state and circumstance. And we combine the, the information from these three domains within our clinical expertise to come to a sort of diagnosis and a treatment plan. We can use the ICF to map out the clinical state and circumstances of our patients. Which we need to do some measurement as well. So I'll illustrate this by giving you an example of a low back pain case. First guidelines of the Royal Dutch Society of Physiotherapy uh, talks about treatment profiles where treatment profile one is low risk, uh, profile two is medium risk, and treatment profile three is high risk. Profile one is no dominant factors for delayed recovery, and people should be seen for no more than three sessions, reassurance, and stay active. In treatment profile two, there may be some factors for delayed recovery, and in treatment profile three, there may be dominant factors for delayed recovery, which are large influence of persistent pain and limitations in functioning. Prognostic factors for persistent low back pain can be related to low back pain, previous episodes of low back pain, high levels of limitations, 
pain in the leg and high levels of pain intensity. Patient related factors may be poor general health or poor health related quality of life. Psychosocial factors that are risk factors can be psychological and psychosocial stress, pain related fear of movement, depressive feelings or complaints, passive coping, or negative expectations of recovery and or catastrophizing. Work-related factors play a role as well. High physical load seems to be a risk factor, poor relations with colleagues and reduced work satisfaction. Looking at different clinical practice guidelines, we see that for treatment of patients with chronic low back pain, the guidelines recommend the use of NSAIDs and antidepressants exercise therapy and psychosocial interventions. And in addition, a referral to a specialist is recommended in case of suspicion of specific pathologies or radiculopathy or if there's no improvement after four weeks. So let me talk about Caitlin. The woman in this picture is an AI generated photo, so she doesn't really exist, but the case is real. And this is about a 39-year-old female who had a 15-year history of back pain with slight radiation into her leg. She had an acute onset of her back pain while moving house 15 years ago with lifting and bending. She got ibuprofen at the time and her physiotherapist told her she had a displaced vertebra. She's had recurrent exacerbation since and the most recent exacerbation started about a month ago and she now has constant nagging pain in her back and she rates her pain as a 6 out of 10. She has difficulty cleaning house, bending, lifting and getting up from a chair. Her work is house cleaning twice a week and she finds it increasingly difficult. She is fearful her complaints will get worse and she's very, being very careful with her back. We now want to use the ICF to come to a health profile of this patient. And to make a health profile, we need to measure impairments, a range of motion, strength, endurance, sensation reflexes, basically your objective examination. You need to measure activity limitations and participation restrictions. We tend to measure activity limitations by using functional or performance tests, such as the stand up and go or the six minute walk test. Um, but we now have access to accelerometers, which allow us to measure what people actually do in their own environment. We can also use questionnaires to get some sense of participation restrictions, and we can use questionnaires to get a sense of personal factors that may play a role in her recovery or not. So we asked her to fill out a body diagram and on the body diagram, her pain is pretty localized without radiation. Of course, it could have looked differently, such as this, where she could have filled in her entire uh, back and pain in her legs. Um, where this may present a worse prognosis than the picture before. We need to sort out the red flags, which could be physiological risk factors. Does she have thoracic pain, fever, unexplained weight loss, bladder of bowel dysfunction, history of carcinoma, ill health or presence of other medical illness, progressive neurological deficit, disturbed gait, saddle anesthesia, age of onset less than 20 or over 55, that's not her, she's 39. No relief at bed rest and unexplained weight loss. And failure of conservative treatment. So the one red flag that this person has is the failure of conservative treatment, but that may not be because of her, but because of the therapy she's gotten to date. So we can now start filling in the ICF nagging back pain, slight radiation into her leg. She has activity limitations in bending over, lifting, carrying and getting up from a chair. And she has difficulty performing household 
tasks. She's getting NSAIDs and she had this physio in the past who told her she had a displaced vertebra, which caused her to be careful in her lifting, bending and carrying. So at this point, what do you think is going on? Possible diagnosis could be primary chronic low back pain, nociplastic pain, or secondary low back pain, where it's unclear what the mechanism of her pain is. It could be neuropathic, it could be nociceptive, or it could be mechanical. Osteoarthritis, spinal stenosis, could have a disc. It could be referred pain from a kidney stone or an abdominal aneurysm. It could be autoimmune or she could have a fracture. The secondary low back pain diagnoses are less likely than the primary low back pain, but it's good to consider that these are possible options. To assess whether people have no nociplastic pain, you can use this clinical decision-making tree developed by Nice and his friends where the first question is whether the patient has pain longer than three months? Yes. Does she have a regional distribution? Yes. Is the set of pain entirely responsible for her pain? Maybe no. She has not likely because her pain is long-standing. And as far as we know, there's no no see Receptive pain. Does she have neuropathic pain? We don't know yet because we haven't tested her uh, neurological status yet. Does she have evoked hypersensitivity phenomena? We haven't tested that yet. But if she had, she would have pain hypersensitivity in all regions of the pain. And then the last one, does she have at least one comorbidity, such as difficulty sleeping, hypersensitivity to sound or temperature? And we haven't asked that yet, so she might have nociplastic pain. We want to sort out her yellow flags. Yellow flags would be a negative attitude that back pain is harmful or potentially severely disabling. Fear avoidance behavior, reduced activity levels, well, we've seen that. An expectation that passive rather than active treatment will be beneficial, passive coping style. Or a tendency to depression, low morale and social withdrawal, such as distress and depression. And social or financial problems. But she has difficulty working, so financial problems are lurking. So she certainly has several of these yellow flags. To make sure that she does have these yellow flags, we could use questionnaires to assess uh, more of her back pain, more of her personal factors by giving her a fear avoidance questionnaire, the catastrophizing uh, skill, look at pain self-efficacy. And the disease specific questionnaires would more look at her lack of participation. The VAS and the NRS scale can give you a sense of pain intensity. Coming back to the ICF now, we have assessed her back and she has some pain with flexion extension. With, she is sore with all propagation tests. With palpation, she has diffuse pain of a pair of vertebrals. Her VO2 max is 50 milligrams per kilogram per minute, which is extremely low. Straight leg raise is negative, sensory test is negative, and her reflexes are normal, which means basically an unremarkable back examination. She certainly has no signs of neuropathic pain, and it's unclear whether she has no plastic pain. Her osteo tree is 70 out of 100, which means she is very disabled. And her Ronald Morris tells us the same. Fear avoidance is high and her 
pain catastrophizing scale is also high and her self-efficacy is low. So now we can start looking at the connections within the domains of the ICF. And it may just be, I'm just hypothesizing, that she became very fearful because of what the physical therapist told her in the past. And that's caused her fear avoidance um, and, her uh, and her catastrophizing to increase, which has led to her activity limitations and those have led to difficulty performing her household tasks or impaired her um, participation. So in this way you can get a sense of uh, how the patient is doing and it visualizes the current understanding of the patient's state of activities and participation, the problems to target and how you could address the most important factors in this patient in your therapy plan. So in summary again, we think that the physio that told the patient that she had a displaced vertebra may have caused fear avoidance in this patient and increased catastrophizing, which has led to limitations in physical activities, which then cause difficulty performing household tasks. So here the primary objective would be to reduce fear and catastrophizing and get the patient to move again rather than address her pain because it doesn't look like that really had any influence on her physical activities. So thank you. This is just an example. Go play with your own patients, see if you can put them in the ICF and whether that will help your decision make. Thank you.